Hey everybody, welcome to Coffee Time at the Water's Edge. We have Dr. Stephen Roby and we have with us again, Donnie Gilmore. Thank you for joining us again, Donnie. You came back for more torture. Yes, thank you for having me. <laughs> and coffee, you guys have creamer this time. <laughs> Steve still doesn't know how he feels about that. <laughs> well, it says an elder of a church is supposed to be hospitable. That's true. So that was the only yeah, thing that drove you me. To, there you go. This to is go true. Drive. Although there, there's a caveat about the creamer and sugar. Uh-oh. You always have to taste the coffee first before you put anything in it. That's fair. Okay. All right. So we are drinking the same thing we drank last week. So Steve, uh, this is Blackout Coffee. Blackout Coffee Company. Morning Reaper. Morning Reaper. Okay. Yes. They have interesting names. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers, my brothers. Jesus. And you know I like it, so that's why I have a subscription to it. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know that was a thing, but oh, yeah. now I do. Oh, yeah. You get five-pound bags of coffee. It lasts about a month and a half. So, that will last me a whole year. And that's whole bean. I get it whole bean. So yep. that's a lot of coffee. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, five pounds. Wow. But it's smooth. I like it. Yeah. Right. Good, good. Steve, I don't know. I don't think I've ever heard you say exactly how you feel about this one. I like it. You like it? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. See? <laughs> I mean, it's a good house. Like, it's something that I would grind and just drink as if I'm making a pot at the yeah. house. Well, that's that's one of, the one, one of the reasons why I like it. And the reason why I order this as a subscription is because the other stuff that we would normally bring on the show can get expensive. Yeah. So, I always have two coffees at my house. I have yeah. my pour over coffee and I have my community group coffee <laughs> <laughs> or my general morning if yeah. i'm going to drink more than a cup because yeah. pour over i only make like a cup yeah. yeah a lot of people don't realize when you get the the locally roasted stuff you're paying bougie man yeah oh wow yeah you're paying some big dollar prices you know when you start paying was it like 16 ounces or something like that of of of, of whole bean coffee for 30 bucks yeah that's a lot that's a lot I mean, it varies so much or five pound bag for fifty. Wow. <laughs> yeah, I'm more of a Costco shopper, so <laughs> that would be the route. <laughs> yeah. Well we're not we don't do K cups on here, so that's <laughs> fair enough. That's all I do at home, so <laughs> yeah. I can't believe you just admitted to that. I did. I'm an open book. <laughs> All right, so for today, we are going to be talking, one of the reasons we, why we brought Donnie on here is because we're going to be talking about biblical manhood, uh, more specifically, I think, in the home and with your family and kids. I think this is a, a topic that a lot more people need to hear about and understand because I think that one of the things about biblical, the church in general is there's a lot of churches out there that don't have a lot of men in them, uh, and I think it's a missing, there's something missing there. Uh, of why men are not in the church the way they should be, especially since they're supposed to be spiritual leaders in the home. Mm -hmm. So Steve or Donnie, whichever one wants to start on this topic. um, What are your original opening thoughts? Well, just statistically, you're right. I mean, I I think there was a study within the last five, 10 years on women in the church and how they outnumber the men by like it was a ridiculous percentage i want to say 25 percent or more Mm. um, but it may even have been higher than that and so there is a a real absence of men in the church and the way that bears out like sociologically um is significant because the other you know study that's often quoted was a study that by focus on the family and that, that this was this is an older one but it's one that i often come back to because it's so telling of how the man sets the spiritual temperature of the home. And the the statistic was, you know, if a church reaches a child, like through a VBS program or WANA's or some sort of program, and they get the kids coming and maybe just getting dropped off, there's only a three and a half percent that the rest of the family will follow along and become a part of that regular attending that church. If, if, If the mother is reached, 
it's somewhere around 17% that the family will follow along, kids and husband. If the husband has reached 93%. It's a drastic change. It, it's huge. Yeah. But, th- I mean, this just bears out. Like, and, and there's just no way ar- around that. Like, God has wired us, and, and for men particularly, to be to set the spiritual temperature in the home for good or for bad. Yeah. And there's uh, far too much passivity, I think, in, in the, you know, among men today. I agree uh, 1,000%. And I also, well, the way I grew up, I saw it. Like, man, if the father isn't in the home, there goes the community. Yeah. There go the churches, the schools. And I think that's why we have such a epidemic now, if you will, of um, kids with behavioral issues, even seen as elementary schools, like teachers are afraid, mm-hmm. as we know what happened in our own backyard not too long ago. Uh, with the shooting so it's like the why like I'm always thinking why but you know it's a spiritual it's spiritual warfare and I think our I know our enemy knows well if I take out the husbands if I take out the men the families then the community is going to crumble so that's why I'm a very big advocate of uh, husbands and fathers and biblical manhood my little slogan I have is pray protect provide if we can do that as men I think that'll change not only our country, but our world. And I think it all starts with biblical manhood in Christ. <laughs> That's where it yeah. starts. Yeah, it's so it's so heartbreaking. At, at my previous church, we got involved in a, a local housing project. Mm-hmm. And the it, it was interesting because the, the management there just kind of gave us an open door to minister among them. Like I did a, a vacation Bible school at their facility, wow. like at their um, apartment complex. We took like 50 volunteers from our church over there and had like 100 kids come out. And what, what was happening there is as I talked to them about the community, because it was, wasn't that far from our church, 93% of their, there's another 93%, 93% of their units, um, and I think they had like 300 units, were mm-hmm. um, single parent homes. The fathers were either dead, out of the picture, or in jail and mm-hmm. man it was you just saw the hunger when I took a bunch of, of good men over there to love on those young men and, and you know those kids it was it was just like a, a magnet right mm-hmm. of attention and, and and love that was being there and so it, it it bears out in all aspects of sociology not just in the church but you know we're talking specifically about the church and mm-hmm. and what kind of responsibilities men have in the church and so I think that's probably where we're trying to go with this conversation is you know what is God commanded what is God ordained to be the responsibility for men as husbands and as fathers in the home mm-hmm. and it's huge well I know I, I for me and just speaking a little bit on on we there was a lot of stuff that I didn't know about fatherhood specifically because the churches that I were that I was in really didn't teach a lot on it and so when Nikki and I adopted our son at 13 years old, mm. um, I had, it was like, I was struggling trying to find, you know, what do I do here as, as, oh, <laughs> as, yeah. as a father? How do I deal with a lot of this stuff? Now I was brought up with a father in the home, you know, and so I tried to, to emulate that as much as I possibly could, but that's all I had to go on. And there were several years of separation, right? Because I was in the Navy for at least 12 years before we got to the point where we adopted. So yeah, it, it was struggle. I, I struggled. I think I struggled as a father. I think there's a lot of things that I could have done better that I look at now, but, but I, I think there, there's a lot of people out there that are like that, even when they get that newborn. Oh yeah. Uh, because they didn't maybe not, they didn't have a good example in the home. And what do you think churches can do? really to to help out with that that situation mm-hmm. yeah I, I think the way god is the blueprint for a church and the way that a church should be organized according to the bible is to have godly men serving as elders who are examples of what christian maturity looks like for manhood and one of the qualifications to be an elder of a church is to be um, a faithful man you know, a one woman man literally and then to manage his household well. Yep. 
And so, th- and, it's, it, and it goes on First Timothy 3 to say, if he can't manage his own household, how in the world he's going to manage God's church? And so there's this oversight given to elders. And so that in itself, the home becomes a microcosm of the church. That's sort of the incubator in which uh, faithful men prove to be so and are thus qualified to serve as elders and pastors of a church. And so if you're in a biblically functioning church, by default, it should have an example of, of godly men who are, you know, majority of fathers. You don't have to be a father, but if you are, you must manage your household well. And so that's one thing is to have a biblical model of leadership. Uh, another thing is to teach on it. <laughs> like that's <laughs> obvious, right? Like yeah. we just we can't avoid teaching on like what responsibilities do parents in general have? What mm. responsibilities do men have? What is biblical manhood? What is biblical womanhood? And celebrate instead of erase gender differences in the Bible. Yeah. That God has wired men differently than women. That there are you know unique things to the complementary roles that we play. And that's a beautiful thing to be celebrated, not to be, you know, erased or denigrated in, in any way. Mm-hmm. That doesn't mean people haven't abused those things. And we can talk about that right. all right. we want. But the reality is that that's for churches. There should be a built in mechanism. You know, if we're discipling people well, older men are to teach younger men, mm-hmm. you know, and older women are to teach younger women. There are these examples that we have among us through the body of good fathers. That, that should elevate to the surface and marriages. So as husbands and as fathers. Yeah, I, I agree. <laughs> Cause if you can't manage your household, like I stop there, like anything I'm doing, even in ministry, if I feel my house is out of order, um, and at times it will be, <laughs> it, mm-hmm. it will be out of order, but that shouldn't be what the consistent rhythm is that right. it's out of order. Uh, but there are times where we have to step back and say, hey, something's not right here. Something's off. Um, and then we have to have those hard conversations with maybe other men, with maybe our wives, uh, with different people that know us. Like, hey, do you see somewhere I can be better? Right. Do you see somewhere I may be struggling? Or here is where I'm struggling. So I think as men, it's hard to admit that. So I think Part of that starts with us as, as men realizing we need help. And I think most of us do, because I talk to a lot of men, but we don't know how to ask for it. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think I think pride is a, is a, is, can be an issue Huge. with men. Huge yeah. issue. Uh, it's harder for men to ask for help than it is for women. Mm-hmm. We know that just by thinking about asking for directions in the car. <laughs> so stereotypical. You guys do that now. <laughs> but, That's why God invented GPS. Yes. <laughs> to bail men out. It's okay. To... <laughs> but I, I think that pride is a major issue with men when it comes mm. to asking other men for help. Even men who are in authority in their lives, like pastors, um, I think it, 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 w- it was hard for me to ask for help whenever we ended up with our grandkids in our home. Um, it wasn't easy. And I had to buck up and say, no, you need help with this. Oh, you need to get this figured out. Well, that's a good example of how, you know, we're trying to function biblically because, you know, that was a, a life altering, you know, moment for you and Nikki. <laughs> and very quickly. And, and as an elder of the church, like we, we quickly recognized that that should take priority. Right. And so, uh, in effect, we put you on the bench yeah. like, mm-hmm. and, yeah, and you obviously for, needed yeah. that. And, and, you know, so it's like, well, let's, let's take a step back so that you can focus on the family, yep. focus on the home. Mm. Um, and you know, we'll carry whatever extra weight we need to as the rest of the elders, uh, so that you can do that. And I think that if churches don't do that, they burn people out and then yep. they run the fear of, you know, not the fear, they run the risk of, you know, their elders becoming disqualified because they're prioritizing the church over their family mm-hmm. where it's 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 the order of the family and the good management of that that actually qualifies you to to manage church yeah. to be an overse- uh, overseer well there was a the, there was a guy named Mark Wilson who was one of the um, one of the pastors that was teaching a program that I was in uh, that uh, told us always make sure to take care of the little church because if you can't take care of the little church you can't obviously take care of the big church and he was talking about your home Mm -hmm. and so um i don't think he put a biblical reference on it at the time but he probably should have but uh but but the 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 sentiment is there 
you know, that if you're not taking care of your home, then don't even think that you're able to take care of the church body that you are supposed to be an overseer for. Yeah. Um, and I think that's what drove me even to look at you guys and say, I think I need to step back for a second and, and, and take care of figure this thing out that's going on. It was a lot. Um, but I think that's where we need to rem- as men have to be able to push our own pride aside. Pride is something that God doesn't like. <laughs> he says it multiple times. It's in the Bible. Go look it up. Yep. He does not like pride. Um, so we have to learn to not but, be prideful. Yeah. Proverbs three actually says God opposes the proud. God, yeah. It's like by maintaining a, a prideful posture, you're actively inviting the creator of the universe to oppose you yeah. in life like, and humble what a, you. <laughs> what a, well, yeah. He will, it was to say that uh, everyone who exalts himself will be humble. humble yeah. but he who humbles himself will be exalted. And so the Lord lifts up the lowly, but he humbles, you know, the high and mighty, the, the prideful. Yeah. yeah. That sticks, uh, to my heart, <laughs> especially when it comes to parenting and being husband. Uh, like last, just last night, and I will advise that all men do this, but uh, know your situation, know your wife, <laughs> like know what you're going through. But last night is about maybe 1 a.m. Uh, we're going to bed, and I asked my wife, well, I told her, I said, well, I have a few questions for you. And maybe just start with one of these questions. Because <laughs> we like were up kind of until like, is coming on right now. <laughs> <laughs> we're up to like 4 a.m. So I'm like, uh, but the conversation was that good. It's like, I don't care, but I need every bit of this. So I asked her um, first, like, what can I do to be a better husband? And to ask that question, you need to leave um, all pride outside the door. <laughs> yeah. Like, leave it and... And I asked her, I said, I want you to be like really honest, very blunt. And I just want it raw. Like, give it to me. And you have to uh, maybe even go to God first <laughs> before you ask that question. Yeah. Because our wives know us better than anyone else, uh, sometimes better than we know ourselves, <laughs> if I could be honest. Which is why when we introduce a new elder, we interview their wife also. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> yes. That is very wise. Yeah. <laughs> and then you'll know, like, uh, am I really, or are they really managing their household well? Uh, so I think that's a great practice, and I, I would not stray away from that. And uh, so we're talking, and she uh, she started with, I don't know if you want the answer to that. <laughs> <laughs> this is getting good. <laughs> and I'm like, oh. <laughs> oh, so... Um, yeah, in my mind, I say that to say, in our minds, I think we are meeting the needs that we think our wives and our kids need us to meet without really diving into what they really need met. Yeah. So in my mind, I'm like, yeah, I'm doing great here. I'm checking all the boxes. But when she gave it to me, I'm like, man, um, like, thankfully, there wasn't anything spiritually <laughs> like you need to do this, but practically. Like, okay, I see you're doing this, but I just need you to be here for me more. I need you to hear me out. And I'm a big proponent of um, actively listening. So I just shut up and got my phone out and took some notes. And it was good. Like, it was good. It was hard. Uh, It was still hard. Uh, We've been together 15, 16 years, and there are things I'm still learning about her and myself. So I'm like, you don't know um, or... I thought I was doing better than what I was. <laughs> I would yeah. definitely say that. But she has needs that she needs me to directly address as her husband. And as far as like, I asked the same question about being a father. Like, where do you see, like, where can I grow? Because I love learning, I love studying, and I love growing. Uh, but these are hard truths you have to face sometimes that you don't have all the answers. Yeah. Well, I think sometimes it's hard for men also to, when their wives are giving critique of things that they're doing wrong, it's hard for men sometimes, I think, in this area again, it all turns back to pride yep. to be able to just shut up and listen. Mm. You know, listen to what they're saying because it's very easy to go, yeah, but. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I had to stop myself almost like this. <laughs> so, yeah, it, it, you really do. You have to check your pride at the door when you yep. when you ask those kinds of questions. 
So, yeah, I think the responsibility. So we kind of started this thinking, what are the responsibilities that we have in the home? I think, you know, I th- immediately go to kind of Ephesians five, Ephesians six. So you see both there. You see husbands love your wife as Christ loved the church. Mm-hmm. Right. And then he goes on to explain about like presenting her as this spotless bride before the Lord, blameless before the Lord, washing her with the word. Mm-hmm. And so there is this sacrificial self-denying love that Jesus had for his bride, the church, that is our standard. And so there is a a kind of sacrificial love. And that's, we always have to highlight that, particularly when we talk about women, uh, wives submit to your husband as to the Lord. It's like, you know, that sounds so negative in our culture today. Yeah. Yeah. But, but we lose sight of the fact that husbands are supposed to lay down their lives, like <laughs> lay down your life for your wife, love them like Jesus, like who, who loves better than Jesus? Nobody. That's the point, right? Greater love has no one than this. Yeah. Love them like that and shepherd them in such a way as the head, the husband is the head of the wife, the Bible says in Ephesians, right? And so if that's true, the head is not insensitive to the rest of your body. In fact, that's the very, I've heard this illustration, the Bible doesn't say this, but like just using the head as an analogy, if 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 I pinch you real hard right here, like real hard, you're gonna get a signal from from that area of your body. It's gonna shoot to your brain. Oh, that hurts. I need to yeah. do something mm-hmm. about it. So the head is reactive to when the rest of the body is in pain or has a need of some sort. And so, like exercising headship as a husband is, you know, being sensitive to the needs of your wife is looking out for her best interests. Mm-hmm is loving her like Christ loved the church. And then it goes on to say, do not exacerbate your children, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. So we have some goals, you know, as we raise our kids, we want them to know the Lord. We want to raise them up in the discipline of the Lord, which requires discipline. (laughs) It requires instruction, like it's built into the command there, right? We have to discipline our kids. We have to instruct them properly, which doesn't guarantee you know, success generally, you know, the proverb says 22, six, train a child in the way they should go when they're old, they won't depart from it, but it doesn't guarantee that your child will. Right. Um, but it does set them up for success. Right. And so I think this, having those responsibilities to love our wives, like Christ loved the church, to raise our kids in the discipline and instruction, which, and if we go back to Deuteronomy six, like one of the greatest commands here, O Israel, the Lord, our God, the Lord is one, love the Lord, your God first, all your heart, soul, mind, strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. And you shall teach these commands to your children. Diligently teach these to your kids when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise up. So all of this is pointing us to shepherding our family, loving them well, um, creating the right temperature um, for the Lord to work in and through our family. And far too many men sit on the sidelines when it comes to this stuff. And and I always had this picture of the Christian man prior to my conversion to Christianity as sort of this Ned Flanders, you know, like weak, simple minded, like just kind of passive dude that was just a really nice guy, um, but but really wasn't like a warrior, like a like strong man. And I'm not like espousing any kind of specific macho-ness, but I, I mean like having a backbone Right. And standing for what's right, speaking against evil, being disciplined—you know the, these these good virtues. Yeah. And so now my my view of manhood completely changed. I had a warped view of masculinity. I think as a non-believer, um, a guy that was really into sports and and combat sports at football at that and stuff like that. <laughs> All right. But then, like converting, man, it just it made me so much more gentle. Mm. And you can be gentle and strong. Yep. Well, I think we discussed that in a, in a previous episode about meek. Meekness. What is the definition of meekness? Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, so I think men have, you, you know, if you're a husband and father, take your family to church. Yep. That's not the only responsibility, but that's helping set a rhythm for God to work. Lead your family at home. Mm-hmm. You know, read scripture together, pray together, do something, Right. Um, and don't ignore, don't be so heavenly minded that you ignore all the practical things of this earth, 
right? Bringing up your kids, like you want them to have life skills. <laughs> like, I have a list of things that I wanted to teach my son. You know, he's right. coming up on 18. I want to make sure that he knows how to change a tire. We yeah. made sure our kids could cook. They do their own laundry. Like all these basic necessities, things that they can, you know, actually put into practice. And yeah. I think parents that are engaged will ensure that they're raising up kids who know how to take care of themselves, yeah. that one day you're going to kick them out of nest and they're going to fly. Right. Um, and But men have to be a part of that. We can't leave all of that up to women. The reason women are so stressed is because men work, and now we expect women to work too, mm-hmm. and raise the family, and do the household chores, and right. why the guys go to work, come home, and you know veg out. And I just think, man, there's we, we put too much of our responsibility on women Mm. and that is crippling it's killing our women and it's crippling our communities like you said yep yep that's was one mindset i had to change um i don't remember who said i was i think listening to an audio book and uh i think it was a pastor but it was like your fatherhood and being a husband starts once you get home from work and that changed my whole mindset yeah. and view of a man. I'm like, so when I would come home, I was just stay in my car for about five minutes, pray. Like, Lord, when I walk through this door, help me to be, help me to glorify you. To still be on, right? Yes. Not to turn off. Yeah. It's like, I'm on for the world when I'm out there. I'm on for my businesses, for whatever I'm doing for my customers. But as soon as I hit the house, I just want to, I really want to get in that recliner. Or just, it's been a long day. Let me relax. Like, no, this is when the real work starts. Real work starts yeah. <laughs> this is a four quarter of life. Like once you get out of that car, and then that's how I had to think about it, like sports. It's like when you're tired, what do you do? You don't just give up, <laughs> right? You got to dig. Mm-hmm. And some days I'm crawling to the bed, but <laughs> it's yeah. worth it. <laughs> just seeing the family and knowing that, all right, I'm teaching them what it means to be diligent. Like, right. I'm modeling that for them. Like a lot of times I didn't have that model. I think that's a big thing. Like. We don't have to be Christ, but we need to model what it means to live like Christ to our families. Yeah. Now, I do think there there is a aspect of, of self-care that does need to happen, though. Yeah. Um, even if it's for like a, a short 15-minute period mm-hmm. where you're able to um, reset yourself a little bit. Decompress. Decompress so you don't burn out. Mm-hmm. Because if you think about it like this, if you burn out at work, I know you own your own business, so. <laughs> so <laughs> right. But working in in corporate society, um, if I burn out at work and I lose my my brain and do something stupid there, I get fired, right? Which at home, I think you can even be more devastating if you lose it. Um, so I think that the, you there is there is a an aspect of this where you do have to make sure you are maintaining some form of self care, uh, especially when you're in stressful situations and stuff like that at home where things may not be perfect at the mm-hmm. moment. I know you brought up the last time you were on about the cleanliness of a house, <laughs> you know, and, and how it doesn't bother you as much as it used to. Right. Um, I think sometimes even me, I have to stop myself sometimes because I know like I, back then I said, this is something I need to listen to, you know, uh, because I, I have a tendency to get a little bit overboard sometimes with making sure everything's as nice as possible. Yep. And it's really hard when you get a two year old and a four year old. Oh, just I know. <laughs> <laughs> I know. They said it's like trying to Tasmanian clean. devil running around the house, you know. Um, All right. But I, I think that, that it's very easy for us to get out of our own temperament that we, you know, that, and we can lose it. Yep. on things like that. So I think I, it, there is an importance for self-care. I, get, I mean, I said all that just to say there's important for self-care. Mm-hmm. But yeah, it is It is important to make sure you maintain yourself also. I yeah. think that's implied in the do not exacerbate your children, right? Mm-hmm. Because if, yeah. you're, if you're stressed to the max, you're more likely to lash out mm-hmm. and to respond in anger yeah. um, at, you know, a, a childhood, you know, misbehavior. Yeah. Versus like lover, lovingly correcting them, shepherding them, explaining to them why they're wrong. You're more likely to say, go to your room or shut up or, you know, or yeah. something like that <laughs> yeah. and respond inappropriately versus like gently correcting them mm-hmm. and, and, you know, allowing that to, to escalate in an, on an appropriate level in terms of correction and discipline. Mm. Um, and that comes with, you know, 
when we don't do that, that's how we exacerbate our children when they don't know why they're being punished right. mm -hmm. or they're just being kids and, and you're overreacting to different things that so you can easily drive them to anger. Yeah. And when, and when you're trying to, you know, be the light of the world and be a model in, in the home for your kids, one of the things that I think is helpful to remember is we're not modeling perfection to them. Yeah. Like one of the most, I think, powerful things that we can do as Christian parents, particularly is to model repentance for our kids and to acknowledge our mistakes. Oh, yeah. That's <laughs> you know, hard. Yeah, <laughs> yes. it is. Um, but I've, I've often told my kids, you know, I responded wrong to that or I shouldn't have said that or, you know, and I think that that, that, that teaches them as much about following Jesus as sometimes my actual obedience does because when they see that I'm not perfect, that I still, even as a pastor, as a father, as someone who, you know, has given their life to service and, you know, in service to the Lord, that... I still sin, but to acknowledge that sin, repent of that sin, confess that sin before them and before the Lord is, is a good model of what it means to follow Christ. Right. I haven't arrived. None of us have arrived yet. Yeah. Um, but that goes a long way for sure. Yeah, you are absolutely right about that. Uh, there have been many times, and I'm even, I'll sit my kids down and I'll say something like, hey, daddy's really tight right now. I don't want to get frustrated. Uh, so let's try to do this together so that I don't get frustrated. You don't like when I yell, and I don't like when you misbehave. So how can we work together? And then I go to think, how would I want God to correct me? Like, well, do I really want God to come down? Like, Jesus had to stand in my place to take that wrath mm. that I wasn't able to bear. So I need to be more gentle. Um, and I think even, I don't know, it could be in the black community, but we are— very strong on uh, whoopings. <laughs> I mean, I think kids need more whoopings. <laughs> but um, Donnie's about to get canceled. For us. <laughs> I'm okay with it. <laughs> Spare the rod. <laughs> Jesus was canceled, so I'm okay with it. <laughs> but yes, um, I, I think um, that can be healthy. But there is a fine line between discipline and, and abuse. Yes. So I always try to not discipline out of anger. Right. I think that's very, very strong. Um, like, all right, let me calm down. Let me breathe in. Because they need to see that I can lovingly correct them, how I want God to lovingly correct me. And then I also think, all right, so years later when they're adults, how do I want my kids to remember me? How would I deal with the situation differently if I was older? Mm -hmm. Like, let's say if they're in their 20s, I want them to look back and say, man, my dad was gentle. He wasn't perfect. He admitted his flaws. He repented in front of us. He taught us that. And I think if more men are willing to do those things, then we'll know how to appropriately do that for our families. I had no clue. <laughs> and, but then I, my stepdad taught us so much about that, about men. All right, I didn't do this right. Yeah. But it takes that model. Like, like modeling is just so huge. Yeah, I, I thank God for the whoopings that I got. <laughs> <laughs> I do too. I would have been messed up without him. Yes, yes. Yeah, I, I would have been one messed up individual. I would, would have been way worse than I. <laughs> but you, you, make, you raise a good point on discipline, though. Like the goal has to be correction, mm -hmm. right? Not just punishment. It's not just a penal thing. It's it's not just punitive. It's it's remedial. It's like for correction, for the purpose of training you in righteousness. Um, and so that, you know, and it may, it, it may look different contextually. Like I had a, my son, Malachi has always been pretty analytical. So I, I don't know if I ever maybe, maybe whipped him, but I'm like, <laughs> I, I don't really have a recollection of, of doing that right. simply because like he was a kid that I, I could, you know, just have a conversation with even at a young age and explain to him why he did what he did was wrong. And he usually responded appropriately to that. And I, I think that being engaged is, is so, you know, important because hey, we're having this conversation about biblical manhood. And it started with the reality that not many fathers are engaged. They're either absent or they're there and they're passive. Yeah. And they just kind of, you, they, we kind of let the women run the house, take care of the kids, do everything, you know, mm -hmm. and, and, you know, and it's just a recipe for disaster. Oh, yeah. And and this goes with like the need to be on the same page with our wives, to actually have meaningful discussions with our wives 
about, you know, what are our goals here? Mm -hmm. Even in discipline and raising our kids, like it's important that we're unified in the way we approach this. We don't want to make one or the other to be out to be the bad guy you know don't yeah. don't don't threaten the kids like oh your dad's going to be home <laughs> like, or, or vice versa like oh, i'm not going to deal with that no you'll let your mom deal with that yeah, when she right. gets home it's like no we need we need to have a unified effort here yeah. and recognize we're a team I, I think that's one of the things that when nikki and i first started the adoption process one of the things that we told each other is <clears throat> and this is very true about kids who grew up in the foster care system maybe we should probably do an episode on on adoption sometime um but one of the things that we had to do was make sure that we were unified in everything. Even if we didn't necessarily agree with what the other person was saying in front of the children, we're going to be unified in front of Josh. We were unified. We may have talked about it later outside or away from Josh's presence, mm -hmm. but in front of Josh, we were going to be in agreement. Uh, and the reason why was because we wanted to make sure that he was not able to use any tools to, to get between us on anything. So if we didn't agree, if I didn't agree with something Nikki did or said to him, I would hold it to myself until later. And then me and me and her would talk about it later. Same with, with if she disagreed with something, because we wanted to make sure we were unified <clears throat> at the time in front of him. Some people may say, well, that's, that's hypocrisy. Well, no, it's not. It's the idea that we want to make sure that the child can't come back to us and say, well, dad said, mm -hmm. or well, mom said, mm -hmm. you know, um, if it was funny, we always say now Josh would come to, to me and say, Hey dad, can I go do this? And I thought, well, what did your mom say? Cause I know you've asked her. <laughs> Yeah, you know so and he'd be like, oh, darn it!" I <laughs> oh yeah. Um, so I think that, especially with, and I know we just got done talking about corporal punishment. Mm -hmm. Another thing with kids in foster care, you have to be very careful with that because a lot of kids from foster care were abused. Yeah, and it's not just the idea that they were abused is the reason not to do it. It's because most of them. If you were to give them a spanking, even the really young ones will look at you and say, that's all you got. Mm. You know what I mean? Because whatever you do to them has been done to them way worse. Mm. So it, there's all, there's a whole different type of, you know, of, of punishment that has to take place yeah. for wrongdoing with a child that comes in foster care. That's why I think eventually we should probably just do a topic or topic on that and what it's like to adopt. Um, Especially teenagers, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a whole different different thing to deal with as a parent. Um, so yeah, corporal punishment. Yeah, if yeah. they're yours and you're you're raising them from babies, it's a little bit different than when you're bringing them in from foster care. So yeah. Oh yeah, it's probably a lot different. Because <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> we um, I always say we inherited a sixteen year old, which is much different than our three, four, and seven year old. Like, cause I've been with them the whole time. Yeah. I can speak into their lives differently. Mm -hmm. I can do things differently. But with her, I had to be uh, more gentle, uh, more loving, more kind. In the moments, I tell my dad, I'm like, sometimes I want to hug her, and sometimes I want to hug her tighter. <laughs> 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 but uh, yes. just knowing that, man, like this is someone that God loves. Yeah. <clears throat> and how do I love her properly? and make her feel like she's adopted as part of a family because I'm adopted as part of God's family. Yeah. So how do I make her feel welcome at home? And you're right, like there's a big difference, and especially when it's a teenager. Yeah. We've all been teenagers once, <laughs> <laughs> and we knew everything. <laughs> so yeah, so it's just me remembering, all right, I was very um, heady as a teenager. I need more grace. Like, yeah. and man, it just breaks me down as a man. Like, I need more grace. I need to be more gracious. God, how can I glorify you in this situation? I was wrong in when I said this. How can I say it differently? I was right in what I said, but so wrong in the tone <laughs> that I said it. Yeah. And that, oh, man, I had to um, deal with that a lot with my wife. It's like, man, I, I enjoy being right. I mean, I think we all do. <laughs> but at what expense? Yeah. And so I'm like, man, it's a team effort. That's good. You got, I'm 
you know, I'm sitting here as you're as you're talking, and I'm reflecting on you know, this passage in Romans 11 that says, "Behold, the kindness and severity of God." Mm. And so, uh, you know, we this conversation we've been in different places, but like we were talking about discipline, and you know, it says that what person wasn't disciplined by their earthly father and later respected him for it that God disciplines those whom he loves um, and so there is a, a good healthy you know reverential respect and fear that's that should be there but not in an abusive way like God doesn't abuse us <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, and so if we use the heavenly father as an example it's like you can see how the nucleus the family the the foundational institution upon which God builds communities and churches and etc. It's so important to image forth the character and nature of our Father as we're conformed to his image to image that forth in terms of grace and mercy and love. And you were talking about, you know, adopted kids and I think it's that a lot of that stems from they already expect to be rejected. Mm-hmm. Right. Because they have been rejected so much. Yeah. And they are so that's just it's almost like they're waiting for it and it's yeah. just to prove themselves right mm. like I'm unlovable or whatever and so man the the kind of environment that we should set the temperature I, I started this conversation talking about the temperature set by men in the homes is one of loving mercy and grace yeah. care protection everything that you said you pray for you know pray protect all of that that's creating an environment in which everyone in your home feels loved, feels accepted, um, and knows that even when they mess up, that there may be consequences for that, but they're still going to be loved. Right. And I think it's it's and it's incredibly important. And I just get I get passionate about this too because I just I think of so many homes in which this is just not the case, yeah. in which the example set is ungodly and unloving mm-hmm. and just negative all around and so there are times where I step back and I reflect on you know Water's Edge and I'm so grateful for the amount of men that are engaged here there's there's very it's a rare circumstance you know for our men to be absent except for deployments because we have so many military folks right and so but it's such a contrast in a lot of ways to even you know a lot of churches just because of the passivity of men right and I just think we gotta we gotta preach against that we got to preach against passive and, and men are to be initiators, to initiate love. That's what Jesus did. He, yeah. <laughs> he initiated love. Right. Like, man, let's do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think, um, and it takes, it takes boldness. It takes the Holy Spirit leading and guiding us. And I always point back to like that first relation, like our first relationship with God, like living imitating Christ, living through the Holy Spirit, like living through us. That's so important. Like if we're not doing that, then everything else is going to be a wash anyway. And then I'm always thinking, how can, how can we point men to Christ? Like first, like how do we really open their eyes? I mean, it's not to, uh, up to us to open their eyes. Like the Lord is already doing that work, but it's up to us to model what that looks like after your eyes have been open. <laughs> And that was huge for me in my life um, around the teenage years, seeing like what that meant, like learning how to pray, uh, learning how to study the word. And man, that was just life changing. I went from, and I think a big thing is I just thought I was unseen and unheard. Right. And I feel like so many teenagers feel that right now. And it may not even, it's not true in a lot of cases, but you can feel that way. And knowing that I was seeing, okay, they see me, I don't have to act out, I'm heard. I went from almost all, let's say, C's and D's to straight A's and B's. And that difference was like a man in the household leading, initiating, right. like, let's go do this. Right, why are your grades like this? Like, Man, I wasn't getting those questions before. Now I'm being confronted, but it's like, what do you do when you're confronted? It's no different than when God confronts us. Like we have, we have decisions to make. We can't just lay down and say, "All right, I'm not going to do anything." As men, as non-believers, it's like no, we're being confronted with things, and we need to respond. 
And we may not always re- respond appropriately, <laughs> but we need to respond even, and I'm trying to teach my kids that, like, even if you try something and mess up, it's okay. Like, I've mm-hmm. learned so much through my mistakes that I'm okay with making them now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I think that, that's just so huge. Um, I guess modeling our, our failures and our mistakes and repenting and showing that hard work and diligence, it does pay off. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's funny that you say that because I look at an example, and I know this is kind of an out-of-the-box weird example, but one of the reasons why I say I, I became a good torpedo man in the Navy mm-hmm. by breaking a lot of stuff and having to learn how to fix it. <laughs> 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 and I, I think that sometimes I was I was one of those people who learned the hard way oftentimes. Yep. Um, and I think sometimes our kids don't understand that what we want for them is to sometimes listen to our mistakes. And as you said earlier, our ability to repent and, and learn from our mistakes. And we give them as examples to our kids. Hey, look, I did this and this, this doesn't, but I think there's also that teenage angst that wants to, well, maybe I can do it better (laughs) or I can do it the right way. You know, but at the same time, we, we do have to be able to, you know, learn from our errors and drop the pride, I think is a big one still. I keep going back to it. Yeah, it's huge. Like we yeah. know, like even thinking about sports, like it's just like built on pride. <laughs> <laughs> like it's almost like you have to be prideful to want to annihilate someone on the other side. Yes. You don't even know who they are because <laughs> your colors and your jersey is different. <laughs> Yeah, but, are we, we going to get back to back to uh, um, talking about sports again and and <laughs> oh, the idols, <laughs> idols. <laughs> <laughs> but that's huge. I think it takes a lot of pride to get there. And I often think about um, like Adam and Eve, like you, yeah. like you were saying, like all right, how can I? I can probably do it better. Like if I was in the garden, if it oh, was yeah. me. <laughs> Yeah, I probably wouldn't have messed up that bad, but I'm like, no, we all would have messed up <laughs> <laughs> that bad. Well, hindsight's twenty twenty, right? right? It's easy to say that we would have been different, but no. yep. uh, yeah, I, I think that's the first place where we see passiveness. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, oh, absolutely. And yep. then is right there. Yeah, right that's there. Where it was breathed. <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, everybody always like, oh, it was the woman that you know got the apple adam didn't do anything to stop it so and he was the one that the lord originally gave the command to yeah right right? and we we assume that he communicated that to his wife that Mm -hmm. they weren't supposed to do that because the devil you know the serpent calls into question what god said and begins to sow that seed of doubt in eve's mind and deceive her yeah but it was adam that the command was given to it was it was adam that ultimately is you know in romans 5 the federal head that takes the the, the blunt of the blame yep. there that in Adam all die, but in Christ, you know, the many can live. And so there's uh yeah, you, I've, I've read a book of me and a group of men who had sons of similar age. We read the book raising a modern day knight. Does that sound familiar to you guys? Mm. I'm not, it was, no. it was, it, so the idea behind this book was that they used the knighthood process as helping to have some sort of rite of passage to manhood. Mm. What is what is manhood? How do we define what a man is? Which is an interesting question because our culture really doesn't have an answer for that. Right. right. Um, you know, and even in culturally practices, like we don't have any rite of passages. You know, we don't yeah. have a necessarily a bar mitzvah or some sort of ceremony or ritual in which this signifies your transition. So what is it in our country? Is it first time you have sex with a woman? Is it, you know, when, when you turn 18, is it when you turn 21, like yeah, at what point strength. are you a man? Yeah. <laughs> when you get drunk, like, right. <laughs> like what is, what, when do you cross that threshold mm. as a boy to a man? And, be, and so they use the knighthood process, which started, you know, as a page and then you have a squire and then you have, wow. I can't remember the process, but it's like page squire and the knighthood. Mm-hmm. And in this book, he offers a definition and he walks through the Genesis passage and he mm. says that a man is someone who accepts responsibility, rejects passivity. That's the first part of it. I can't remember the rest, but but rejecting that passivity and accepting the responsibility that God has given us in the home as husbands and as fathers, it puts us on the right path to you yeah. know, being mm. good godly men. Well, maybe that's something that we are missing in society today is a legitimate rite of passage that isn't all those negative things. Yeah. 
um, with our children, you know? And uh, so, yeah, I agree. I mean, we, we don't have the bar mitzvah like the Jewish culture has. We don't have now. I mean, I think in, in some churches they would say that their rite of passage would be, um, the acknowledgement of their baptism and especially in churches that have confirmation. Yeah. Confirmation. I don't know if it has to do with me. But it really didn't. No. I mean, you gotta remember I went through it as, you know, because I grew up Lutheran Mm. and so no, I really didn't have any rite of passage type thing to it the way it should, if they're going to use it for that. Um, but yeah, I don't, I think it is kind of absent from our, from our society. So that's, that's good. I guess the question is, how do we help to establish that? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we're doing it right now. <laughs> yeah, because like if you don't know what you're shooting for, then... Yeah. Hmm, that, but the world will give you definitions. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe I'm going to look that book up. I think we... <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I was walking... Up, that was one of the sad things when I moved to Virginia Beach, because those, those men, we were doing like this whole thing with the kids. and wow. We even took them out. We did a ceremony... Um, I think they were seven at the time and it, and it kind of like officially dubbed them as a squire or whatever or yeah. page. I can't remember which one comes first. I think right. it's a page and then a squire yeah. and then night and like age 13 would have been the next step. And then I think age 21 was knighthood. Now I think there were societies, more secular societies that tried to do similar things like, you know, the boy scouts of America and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Um, now we know where that's gone, yeah. you know? Um, but I, I think that the, the church, is kind of absent in that. And I think the church needs to be more involved with things like that Mm -hmm. than they are. It is good to hear that that was something that you guys were doing. That was probably at town, right? When you were, yeah, it wasn't like an official church thing. These were guys that went to our church, Yeah, Um, but it wasn't like a ministry of the church. It was just something me and a couple of dads did. And we'd crafted like this code of conduct of honor for them. And Mm -hmm. Elliot, my my buddy Elliot does calligraphy. So he literally wrote it (laughs) in calligraphy writing. That's cool. And all of us signed it. We did the ceremony with the kids. And and that was on a camping trip. We called it a man trip. We took them camping. And we made them catch their own fish and (laughs) eat their own fish that they caught that evening. um, At least try it. (laughs) Um, But it was neat, you know. And so that was like one of the things that I lamented when we were moving away because we were like, on that trajectory and so each step like at age 13 we wanted to do some sort of challenge for them that would be this rite of passage it was going to be like a long hike in the woods like a and you know all along the way teaching them skills and and things like that Mm -hmm. that would be helpful for them you know as as they grow accept responsibility teaching them to accept responsibility yeah so the the virginia triple crown all by yourself right that's the (laughs) just kidding just kidding (laughs) Oh, that, that'd be a little difficult for a seven-year-old. I'm just saying. <laughs> well, this would have been 13, but yeah. yeah. But no, I, I I agree. I think that there there needs to be something more um, within the church to to help men. Number one, learn how to be better fathers, yeah. husbands, um, and then also for bringing up young men to even learn that at an earlier age, so they may not have to make the mistakes that. Men like me. Well, this is discipleship. <laughs> this is what we're that talking about. That is exactly about. what we're talking about here. <laughs> discipleship. About. How about that? Yeah. So I'm like one of my one of my crowning jewels of ministry in my head. Like one of the things that brings me the most joy is to look at the the guys that are now in their 20s. You know, like Jacob, for example, and and some of the guys that were in my youth group, and to see how they are now loving husbands and fathers and serving as leaders in their churches and serving the Lord and. Um, these are men that I invested a significant amount of time into teaching and discipling when they were yeah. teenagers and they were younger. And so it's such a beautiful thing to see that, mm. you know, um, done well, like the sort of the fruit of that. Yeah. It's such a blessing. Yeah, oh, that's good. And we see it modeled mm-hmm. throughout the Bible, especially with Paul. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like if you think of like a Paul and Timothy, like we see it, it's been modeled, but how do we do it now and do it well? Like it is discipleship. Yeah, it's like Timothy two two, right? He's talking about four generations. What what I've taught you, yeah. Entrust that also to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Yeah. So you have like four generations there, like from this person to this person to another group of faithful men, yeah. the next generation, and it's it's so important. And maybe that's what we've lost, like that passing of um, just the right, the right of passage to manhood. And really being there 
actively there. Like we can be there, like passively there. But how do we how do we be there actively? Uh, and that doesn't mean you're in everything. I'm learning that. Yeah. You know, there are boundaries. Like I don't have to be every waking moment with my kids, but when I'm there, like what's the quality of time I'm giving them? Yeah. I, this is just out of nowhere, but one little step that I think men can take is taking these things hmm. and set them down. Yeah. You know what I mean? I see you. <laughs> and, and actually being active in their kids' lives. Yeah. I mean, that's, I think that's one of the being active in other men's lives. You know, I, I think that we've become a culture that is attached to this too much scrolling around in, in social media and, you know, and stuff like that. And I think that, that's that's a cultural thing that's happening and it's it's happening in a way that is very destructive Mm -hmm. to not just men but women also um but i i do think that yeah i think that we need to unchain ourselves from some of these things and do more with our kids and with our brothers in christ um in in what i call real life not on social media so Hey, you, you said unchain like we're slaves. And I, the whole time we've been sitting here, I've been trying to figure out what his hat stands for. <laughs> and I see SLV, so like slave in my mind. Like, what is, what is, and Salvation. I could be way off. Salvation. Salvation. Oh, now I get it. <laughs> see, and it's, a, it's a talking point because like when people are like, what does that mean? Then like salvation, then you start talking about the Lord. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I, my mind was slave to no one except for Christ. Because the last time you said, you know, this yeah. is your life goal is to be a slave to Christ. And yep. so I was way off though. Now but we're the good. one that says worship without the vows. Yeah. yeah. It's like, now so I get worship. It. Like yeah, people yeah. Went automatically think worship. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, it is. It's worship. And, and so, yeah, starter pieces. <laughs> <laughs> good deal. Uh, love hats. I'm bald. So. <laughs> <laughs> Why do you think I wear a hat now too? It's, uh, I notice how much light shines off my head whenever, and it's not good light. <laughs> I want to make it easier for you guys in here. Like the light of the world. <laughs> Bald men. At the top of my head. The light and the salt. And I got to watch that too, so. <laughs> oh, well, gentlemen, this has been a great discussion. Thank you oh, so yeah. much for joining us, Donnie. We love having you on. And Steve, thank you for being here also. And... All of you who are watching and listening, thank you for joining us in this conversation. Don't forget, you can leave comments down below. If you are watching this video, don't forget to subscribe and click that bell so you know when we release new videos. So if you are listening to not listening on Apple Podcast, if I can get my words out today and I'm struggling here, too much coffee, I think. Make sure you leave us a review so we know how we're doing because we do like to know how we're doing. So thank you all and we love you and God bless.